Copyright, University of Auckland, all rights reserved. The content and delivery of lectures in this course are protected by copyright. Material belonging to others may have been used in these lectures and copied by and solely for the educational purposes of the university under licence. You may record the lectures for the purposes of private study or research, but you may not sell, alter or further reproduce or distribute any part of these lectures to any other person. Failure to comply with the terms of this warning may expose you to legal action for copyright infringement by the copyright owner and or disciplinary action by the university. For the um, Yogo Framework for Action, which was the main uh, blueprint document, um, or bl blueprint agreement signed by 167 countries, I think, in 2005 in Yogo in, in, uh, in Japan under the um, uh, leadership of the of the UN uh, International Agency for uh, Disaster Reduction, ISDR. And um, so this document, the HFA Yogo Framework for Action, came to an end uh, last year. And um, a big meeting was organized in, in Sendai in Japan with 180 plus countries who ultimately, after very long negotiations and, and diplomatic um, closed door meetings, uh, came up with this Sendai framework for disaster risk selection, which is the blueprint document now guiding DRR, disaster risk selection, for the coming 15 years uh, worldwide. So it's not a binding treaty, so there's no obligation to actually uh, meet the outcomes, expected outcomes of the, of the Sendai framework. But each and every country will have to report uh, on a mechanism which is not yet defined and on a time frame which is not yet defined, possibly every two or five years, not yet sure, uh, about their achievements in terms of meeting the goals of the uh, SFDR. And this is what we want to talk about today, where uh, New Zealand uh, cities and, and, and regions are in terms of uh, moving towards uh, achieving these goals. So these goals are basically four. Uh, the first one is about understanding disaster risk. And this is very much inherited from uh, the Yogo framework, which had the same, the same goal. So understanding why we have disasters, basically. The second goal is about uh, strengthening disaster governance. Um, so how we embed um, DRR within everyday governance and, and development and, and, and um, councils for management in New Zealand. Uh, the third goal is about investing in DRR, so putting the, the appropriate resources towards uh, achieving these goals. And the fourth goal is about preparedness, it's about actual DRR, and it's about building back better, so recovery, which is new somehow compared to the HFA before, which was more um, pre-disaster focused. So what we're going to have now uh, is that uh, Misha, Kate, and Keith are going to talk about uh, these goals. So Kit is going to talk more about the first goal somehow, understanding disaster risk. Uh, Kit is going to talk second on the second and third goal, so the governance and uh, investing in DRR. And Misha uh, will talk about the fourth goal, uh, which is again about uh, investing in preparedness, uh, actual DRR, and uh, build back better or recovery. Does this make sense? Yeah? So, Keith, the floor is yours. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Keith Sutters, work with Civil Defence Emergency Management. I've been in emergency management. <laughs> That's the first emergency order. Uh, I've been in emergency management for 30 years, and I've spent the last year working with Civil Defence here in Auckland. I've got eight years working with the FBI in Homeland Security in the United States, and 20 years working with police uh, and the military in the United Kingdom. Uh, I'm an operator. 
I'm the sort of person that goes on the ground and tries to help. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you about now is not from a strategic level, uh, it's more looking at the framework from an operational level and how we will help communities. There are pictures on here, but there are not many words because I want to invoke a few thoughts from yourselves. New Orleans, Katrina, actually happened whilst I lived over in the United States. So I've got a lot of information and feedback with regards to what happened there. But a statement that came out from the city resilience uh, document that they created in New Orleans, and I'll quote this because I don't want to get it wrong. City resilience is the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems within a city to survive, adapt, and grow no matter what kind of chronic stresses and acute shocks they experience. There's your community member, there's your city, and that's what's left of his property. I've got to try and help that. I've got to try and prevent something like that occurring, or at least reduce those risks. Who do I also need to invest in that in order to, do, to be successful in doing so? So as an organization, I'm here to help. Who do I need to actually buy into that in order to make it achievable? Everybody, you know, fundamentally, him. If he doesn't want any part of resilience, there's no point in me even being here, because that's the person I'm here for. And they need to be part of everything that we're going to discuss today. So as a community member, regardless of what your job is, regardless as to what your nationality is or where you live, if you don't buy in to civil defense and looking after the community, then there's no point in us even beginning. So the fundamental part about this is everybody sitting in here today, you have to be responsible for this. You have to actually want to do this. Because without that, we're not going to go anywhere. So bear that in mind. <clears throat> here in the Auckland region, we have what we call local boards who are elected members of councils that look after people. Again, I'm going to read you a statement that comes out of the local board guidance when you become an elected member. And it reads as follows. A local board's responsibility is to ensure Auckland is ready for emergencies and civil defense events, forming partnerships with other emergency services, such as the police, fire, and health services, to ensure a coordinated response, responding appropriately to minimize the impact of events, developing community preparedness, and planning for disaster recovery. Show of hands. How many people here think that their local board is invested in civil defense? One, two, okay? Is that a good reflection on the community that's sitting in front of me today? Where would you rather see that? Up at the 90s, 100% perhaps? That'd be ideal, but I got two people out of what? 30 people sitting here today who believe that their local board, their governance, your community is invested in civil defense and looking after you. We're going to talk about a few things today that suggest that we need that number to be far higher. Council have to be vested in this. And in doing so, when we elect our members to support us in the community, we have to have faith that they are also invested in this. And it, var it varies. We've got obviously colleagues from Wellington as well. They have the same issues as we do in Auckland. Uh, obviously, we may differ in certain circumstances, and there's a lot of good rivalry uh, between us. But ultimately, we have the same issues. Communities in some places are well invested in this and really all passionate and want to get this done. Other communities, and I have to say right now, the CBD is one of them, they're not interested. It won't happen to me. Why should I be bothered about emergency management? Why should I be bothered about civil defense? Wellington has the problems. Christchurch has the problems. We don't here in Auckland. So why would I invest my time and effort in that? Cub Scouts have got a motto. Anybody know what it is? Sorry? Thank you. Be prepared. That's all I'm asking of my community as a member of civil defense, is be prepared in the hope that you never need it. Because if you're not prepared and you do need it, you're in trouble. Yes, we will come and help you. We won't be there straight away. You have to survive for a period of time. They say three days in all of the books and the manuals, but it could be longer than that. And in Christchurch, it was up to two weeks for some people in communities to survive. So again, be prepared. 
First priority that JC alluded to, risk. I have a document here. This is Auckland wide, hazards that you're likely to face. Doesn't really talk about risk. Doesn't talk about the likelihood. Doesn't really talk about severity or what's going to happen to you. But it just gives us a list of hazards that you know, are going to happen one day in Auckland. And that includes your earthquakes, includes your volcanoes, things like that. When was the last time you had a volcano erupt in Auckland? I don't even live here, and I know. 600 years ago, that rang hotel? Yep. Yeah. So the likelihood of another one happening anytime soon, you could probably say is slim, but you can't guarantee that. However, there are other hazards that are more likely to happen here that you should be more interested in. So what happens if you lose power at home? Does that affect you? Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> there is somebody in here that loves to talk. Oh, sorry, I thought you weren't allowed to talk when you came in. Um, so you lose power at home. How many people here know straight away where to get the nearest flashlight or torch? OK, about a quarter of you. Yeah. How many people know that you'd be able to survive with food, water, cooking abilities without power? Good. You know, the idea is you should have everybody's hands up here. I've got a barbecue sitting outside the door, so I don't need power to use that. Right? If you've got gas available to you, every Kiwi's got a barbie. Right? So you'd be able to cook yourself some food. How many people here rely on power to get water? How many people turn the tap on? Water comes out the tap, but I've absolutely no idea where it came from. You know, it just, it leaks water when I want it on demand. You know, I have a septic at home. I have to make sure I look after that because if I don't, um, obviously my waste will start to overflow. I have water in tanks. When I turn the tap on, it comes out, but I can follow the trail of where it comes from. So I have a vested interest in making sure it works. Again, it's back to me as an individual making sure that if I lose power, I know exactly what I do. And as a result of many of the hazards described in here, you're probably going to lose power if it's that bad. So that's the first step. If you lose power, can I still survive? Yes, you can. Everyone in here is resilient. You may not know it, but you are. You don't need a little bag stuck at the side of the corner there that's full of stuff because you, your cupboard's full of that stuff. Your fridge is full of that stuff. Your freezer's got food in it. That's all you need. And if you haven't got it, your neighbors have. How many people here can honestly say they know who their neighbours are? About a quarter of you, you know. I'll be the first to admit, I don't really know who my neighbours are. But if there's an emergency, I'm hoping I can knock on their door and not face a shotgun or something for trespassing. You know, at least I'll get some help. Uh, so knowing your neighbours before these things happen is even better. So what we have is a book of hazards, but we don't really look at the risks. So perhaps we need to spend a lot of more time in looking at that and what the likelihood is of what these hazards are going to happen. And there are some hazards that, that are happening today, unfortunately, that we don't even count for. Acts of crime, acts of terror, they're part of civil defense now, whether we like that or not, because that will affect your community. And my job as civil defense is to look after that community. Governance, I won't go into this in too much depth, but that sentence I read out to you about the local board, that is your governance. Those are the people that are looking after your community from a council perspective. Uh, and at the end of the day, your government signed up to the Sinai framework. That should filter down to your local boards and your councillors to look after you. So there has to be things in place, rules, regulations, plans, uh, and community meetings for you to express your opinions. Uh, the last slide I show you is called uh, Shape Auckland. There is actually um, a consultation period at the moment open to the public starting on Monday next week where you can have your say in how we do this from a civil defense and a council perspective. I'll put the website up at the end here and let you know about that. Invest. This isn't just money. This is investing in your community. Now, what I'm saying today is my opinion, not necessarily what the civil defense or the council actually say. We have to pay $20,000 to farmers to be in the Santa Parade. That's $20,000 from civil defense's budget that I could better invest in the community. So I'd love it if farmers turned around and said, actually, we'll just charge you 10. You can use the other 10 to actually invest in the community. Right? So I'm not actually swapping any money, but I've got a partner there that'll help me to help you. 
And what we need to do is to invest in a lot more of those partnerships and work with each other to achieve those things. So there's no money involved. There's time, absolutely, in volunteer groups, people like that. I love this. This is now a road traffic sign that's appearing in Europe. This is Build Back Better. Before, in my day, as you were getting older, you had to watch out for the old folks in the middle of the road. Now you've got to watch out for the people Twittering and Facebooking as they stand in the middle of the road or on the zebra crossing and you drive around the corner and there they are, paying no attention to you whatsoever with their earpieces in as well. So build back better. We need to identify what's happening tomorrow and build for that. We're putting tunnels in right now as an infrastructure to support Auckland. Perhaps monorails is the way to go for the future so we don't have to dig underground. Who knows? But we have to think about that now in case there was a disaster of some description. This is the guide I referred to that talks about hazards in Auckland. And that's what we basically, uh, we're basing all of our education, all of our public knowledge, and the way we're going forward through the Sandai framework. 15 minutes isn't long to talk about this stuff. But other documents, hazard response. I can tell you what a hazard is, but that's no good to you if I only give you half a story. You need hazard response. What do I do in the event of a tsunami? What do I do in the event of an earthquake or a volcano? What does my family do? Are they ready? Even if you volunteered to help your community, you would damn well make sure that your family was safe before you actually deployed to do something else. That's what happened in New Orleans with all the emergency services. They made sure their families were safe first, and then they went to deal with whatever the problem was. And that caused a few issues. Community response plans. Trying to get your community involved in this. Some communities are very passionate because they're already resilient. Other communities don't want to know. We've got to try and get over that bridge and educate them. The kids in schools over here, brilliant. What's the plan, Stan? All your younger children will know how to do this stuff. But we have a gap because when you go to high school and you go to university, we forget about you guys. We think you're ready for it. And then we start talking to the adults with Get Ready, Get Through. These are some of the documents we have. They talk about resilience. I hate the word resilience because it means so many things to so many different people and organizations. But the eight R's, the four that we traditionally understand, reduction, readiness, response, recovery. The other four that I would add is that word resilience. Are you resilient? I suggest you are, but informally. I want to formalize that. What is your role if there's an emergency? Looking after your family, I hope, is number one. But what's your secondary role? What would you do after that? What are the responsibilities of your community? and the people that work for your community. And finally, rehabilitation. How do I get back to business as usual? How do I get better? Almost done. I love this picture. I actually showed this to a colleague. She went, oh, I don't like the colors. This is meant to depict a disaster and then getting back to where you want to be. OK? What would Auckland City look like tomorrow if it was flattened? I suggest it would probably look differently. And what we're going to do with you today is work out what differently looks like and how do we get there. Community and you, front and center. And that's everything just about around you that will support you in surviving a disaster. This is the before, during, and after. How do we prepare you? How are we proactive? How do we educate you before this happens? During, definitely your response operationally, which is where I come in, trying to help you during your time of need. And then after, the recovery period, which actually starts at the beginning. I should be teaching you how to recover long before you need to. So that's my contact details if you need to. That phone is on 24-7. I actually live out of Bethel's Beach on the West Coast, so there's no reception. So that's great for me when I'm at home. All right. Uh, however, if you want to have more say in this and what your community should be prepared for and what your councillors should do, please visit that website as of Monday next week and start to put some of your comments in writing. It will definitely shape the way we do things in the future. We won't capture it all today, but this is your opportunity to have your say. Thank you.
Beautiful. Hi, so I'm Kate and I'm the Community Science Coordinator from East Coast Lab. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach and I'm going to take you through what East Coast Lab Life at the Boundary is and then I'm going to look at how our activities are fitting into um, the Sendai framework. So um, I have only started my role in October last year. Um, my role is actually funded by the Ministry of Civil Defence Emergency Management through their Resilience Fund. And although I'm hosted by the Hawke's Bay Regional Council, I also um, technically work for the 15 different partner organisations um, that are involved in East Coast Lab. So, um, our overall aim of East Coast Lab is to improve the resilience of East Coast communities to natural hazards associated with the plate boundary and living on the coast. So, East Coast Lab is multi-regional, so it covers Gisborne, Hawke's Bay, Manawatu, Wanganui and Wellington regions. It's also multi-agency, so we've got local government, we've got civil defence emergency management groups, we've got the Crown Research Institutes and also um, local universities. It's also multi-hazard, so it started off looking at earthquake tsunami and has expanded to a volcanic hazard and also coastal hazards as well. Um, and it's still growing, okay? So we've appro been approached by the South Island to also increase, um, introduce them into the region, but at this stage, it's already pretty big. Um, so the Hikarangi tectonic plate boundary um, runs down the, um, the east side of the North Island, um, and it's about 150 kilometers offshore from the Hawke's Bay region and about 50 kilometers offshore from the Wellington region. Um, so you can see that down there. And this is where the Pacific Plate is subducting under the Australian Plate. So communities on the East Coast, um, they obviously live rather close to this boundary and um, can be affected by a number of different hazards associated with the Plate boundary and also living on the coast. Um, so East Coast um, Lab started, um, obviously from the awareness of risk, um, this, these regions all have historically quite large natural hazard events such as the 1940s um, tsunami that affected the Gisborne coastline with waves that came up to about 10 metres above sea level, um, the 1931 Hawke's Bay earthquake or I think this is the 2008 earthquake um, that obviously had a minimal impact on the region. Um, but of course, these regions can all be affected. And then when we're bringing in ideas about the mega thrust earthquake, it brings in another dimension. Um, we're also vulnerable to secondary hazards associated with volcanic eruptions. Um, and so this is kind of what brought this on. We wanted a multi-regional response to these hazards because of course these hazards don't stay within the region, they are multi-regional. So also, um, was uh, impetus was this for the East Coast Lab was also a tsunami risk um, survey. So um, participants in Napier were asked, what would warn you of a potential tsunami in Napier? So they're given a number of responses and 17% of the responses considered an earthquake as a warning of tsunami. So if we have a local source tsunami, so coming from the Hikaringi margin trench boundary, whatever you want to call it, um, it's probably gonna be less than an hour. Okay, so that's when they've got to rely on the natural warning signs such as a long or a strong earthquake, whereas only 17% of those surveyed were aware of that. 67% um, responses cited sirens as tsunami warning signs, and of course that varies depending on where you are along the coast, whether or not there are actually siren responses. Um, and then also 65% cited TV or radio as a tsunami warning. Okay and that's more what you get when you're getting them from like distance tsunami sources. Um, it also started to leverage off national and international research of around 30 to 40 million dollars. So there's a lot of research money that's going into understanding the plate boundary, understanding natural hazards that affect these regions and the impacts on communities. So the US National Science Foundation has selected the Hikarangi um, boundary is one of three significant tectonic plate boundaries that they're putting a lot of money into. So it's coming, international money is coming into New Zealand to look at the hazards along the East Coast and we've also got national um, investment in it too. So we want to, um, yeah, make the most of that research. So um, in 2004, a steering group was formed. So this brought together a wide variety of um, different stakeholders. 
It initially started between Hawke's Bay and Gisborne, and then a few other heard of the idea, and now it's expanded down to the Wellington region. Um, funding was sought, so that was the um, Ministry of Civil Defence. Um, community Science Coordinator was appointed, so that's me. Um, and then now we currently have a project plan. We've got our goals, we've got our objectives and our activities to work um, towards achieving that. So we're not quite yet officially launched. That won't be until later this year. Um, so we're still in process. And this is a project, so we're aiming for five years and then again we'll continue to reflect on it as we go through. So as I said, we've got a number of diverse um, partners. So we've got the GNAS, Natural Hazards Research Platform, NIWA, Massey University, the Joint Centre of Disaster, um, Earthquake Commission, Ministry of Civil Defence, Gisborne District Council, Hawke's Bay Regional Council, Hawke's Bay Civil Defence, Greater Wellington, Minowatu, Wanganui, Civil Defence Emergency Management Group, National Aquarium of New Zealand, Napier City Council, and Living at the Edge, which is a research group. So we've got a wide, wide variety there. And I guess coming from an academic perspective, um, that's probably going to be critiqued because it is quite top down, as I'm pretty sure JC would mention. Um, but in terms of this, these are all people that are, councils are hopefully working in the community and the civil defence groups are hopefully working in the community and so are aware of the risk. Um, so again, as I said, our overall aim was to increase the resilience of communities. So we've got four different objectives, and these are based around research, education engagement, risk reductions, and then a fourth one, which is learnings. So our research objective is to foster well-connected and coordinated research within the natural lab to increase our understanding of natural hazards. So as I've already said, there's a lot of research that's going on and we want to leverage and learn from this research and make it easy for scientists to do research here. Um, we've also created a research database so we know what research is going on, project timelines, who they're involving, what they're doing, their budgets, um, and we're also looking to form a research strategy so we can identify gaps in the research and look at where um, funding can best be placed to continue on. Um, we also want to encourage researchers to develop citizen science projects. So we want communities to be less apprehensive of the science that is going on. We want them to be engaged and involved in the science. Um, so we've created a citizen science um, guideline for researchers to get them um, starting into those projects. And we also want to share project updates um, so that communities are aware of the science that is occurring. So this is um, just a screenshot of the research database. So it's got planned projects, active projects, and also finished projects. Um, you know, the institutions that's doing it, the lead um, PI, um, what sort of questions and goals it's looking at and a little bit of background there. Um, and we want to kind of hopefully develop this into something like Devora, um, which has their work stream plans for the research areas too. Okay, so this also includes New Zealand research, um, research from I think the main four countries is America, Germany, Japan, and New Zealand, and I think there's one other country that we have um, researchers focusing on the East Coast. So our second objective um, is to encourage communities to become engaged and participate in science so that they understand the risk and become le less apprehensive of the risk. So um, late last year we launched the virtual lab, so it's www.eastcoastlab.org.nz and this is a place where um, people can come to take, learn how to take part in the science, um, discover about natural hazards, so there's a bit of information and background kind of education side of it, um, explore the science that is happening right now so they can look at the research projects that are going on, look at the research questions that scientists are trying to answer, um, and also look at who the scientists are um, and they give a bit of their background and then also the news, so um, looking at the research updates around that too. So it's really about dissemination of the scientific knowledge to communities. Um, the website really came about as um, East Coast Lab developed and we actually needed somewhere to go for people to actually find out about it and what it is. Um, 
and again, it's yeah still being developed. Um, we're also looking at developing the lab. So this is a physical lab. It's an interactive education space um, that will be smack bang on the East Coast. Um, and we're also looking at developing, well, we've got some citizen science projects underway. Um, we've got the chip in initiative through Rotary, um, which is looking at tsunami awareness. It's um, created by the community. We've got the King Tides project, again, something initiated by the community. And a Māori oral histories project, which looks at the Matarangi Māori perspective. Um, so hopefully that will be funded. Um, and then late last year, we also had the Turumoko Roadshow for primary schools that went around to rural communities and taught them about um, tsunami and earthquake um, hazard risk and what to do and encouraged them to develop family plans, etc. So that's a picture of the roadshow there. We also want to um, risk reduction, so this occurs when we know of our risks and we can get our community involved and obviously participating in the DRR, but also improving the pathway from science to application. So um, even currently now it's already occurring, so I know of the research projects that are going on and I can link it to the civil defence groups that might be interested in learning about the project, etc. Um, encouraging different approaches to science, so that's where we want to encourage like other perspectives, so we've got um, the Matarangi Māori um, project underway um, and looking at other forms of scientific understanding and knowledge um, and learning from that. Um, part of our funding we also have to create like a how-to guide. So there's a number of um, regionally branded hazard studies you might have heard of Devora volcanic hazards in Auckland or it's our fault down in Wellington. Um, and so we want to provide some guidance for future regional branded studies and see if this is even successful or effective. Um, and part of the learnings is also continue to reflect on it. So is the project working? Is it effective? Is it doing what we're setting out to do? Um, which is quite a big aspect of this. So when we're looking at the Sendai framework, what I've just done is I need to be speaking about priority two and three. And what I've done is I've picked out a few quotes um, from the framework and have just talked, I'm going to talk around what we're doing to kind of help achieve um, what the Sendai framework is aimed to do. So priority two talks about strengthening disaster risk reduction to manage disaster, disaster risk. And so it talks about coordination within and across sectors as well as participation of relevant stakeholders as needed. So this is not a direct aim of East Coast Lab, but it's come about as a byproduct because we're bringing diverse range of stakeholders together and we're starting conversations um, around natural hazards and it's across different regions. Okay. Um, it's also identifying and building awareness of disaster risk, risk knowledge and that's what we're wanting to build within the community. We want them to be aware of the risks, aware of the hazards, so that they want to know how to be prepared for these, um, for the, a potential event. Um, coordinate reports on local and national disaster risks. So again, we're bringing together the stakeholders where we can then connect. So again, last week uh, there was a new study that's just been funded um, um, based on genius science, and I sent that to the Civil Defence Emergency Management in Gisborne, being like, hey, you might be wanting to know the results of this study, seeing as it's got a Gisborne case study. Whereas before, there might have been a slight disconnect. Um, to mainstream and integrate disaster risk reduction within and across all sectors. So we want to start making conversations about disaster risk reduction within the community so that they kind of like obviously take it up. Um, yeah. Um, and also again, seeing as we are bringing a diverse range of stakeholders, we're also exchanging good practices and programs for cooperation. So all the different civil defence, emergency management groups are talking together about what plans and processes that are in place because they're actually coming together in one room um, ever so often to talk about different situations and scenarios. Um, so obviously there is quite a lot of investment going into disastrous reduction. I'm pretty sure everyone else would say that there can definitely be more money in that area. I don't think anyone was going to be like, no, less money. 
Um, but we really, really want to build on the money that is going in from the science area and also hope to attract more money into this area too as people see the results of DRR um, in practice. Um, to promote cooperation between academic, scientific and research entities. So again, linking all these different groups together, I think that's what we're also achieving. And that is me. Hello everyone, is it working? Okay. Um, I'm Misha and I'm from the Wellington Region Emergency Management Office. I'm gutted Keith left because I was looking forward to some friendly debate. Um, my goal that I'm going to talk around is enhancing preparedness for effective response and recovery, which is the fourth goal. Um, and I'm going to say I actually love the word, word resilience. Um, I think it's um, broad ranging um, in terms of it's um, a lot better than I think preparedness because preparedness sort of stops at that survival stage. But why, why stop there? Um, resilience is much more beyond that and it talks a lot about bouncing back from something um, and it engages with a lot more um, people and um, on what society really goes around. So this for effective response and recovery, I think recovery has sort of become a sort of taboo thing that no one really talks about because no one really knows what it is or how to do it. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what the Wellington Civil Effects Group is doing in terms of um, engaging communities in this resilience space um, to enhance their resilience and, and for their response so people are able to respond but also to actually recover better. So this is our um, Civil Defence Emergency Management Framework, or what we'd like to term it as community-driven emergency management. Um, because as Keith and Kate have both pointed out, um, if our communities are not coming along this ride with us, then we're going to have a lot more to do, um, and we can't simply do it on our own. So it's um, a lot of actors coming together. Um, and as you can see, we've kind of got this pyramid of things. And preparedness or resilience really begins at the household level. There's those individuals being empowered to have something um, to contribute to their own lives and um, their own resilience day to day as well as when something large happens like an emergency. For Remo, we create um, some opportunities within these um, two, first two levels, so the household level and the neighbourhood level. Keith talked about, about getting to know your neighbours. Um, that's one of our biggest... Um, Yes, pushes because you know in an emergency it's the people around you that are going to be there um, to help you first off um, and you know the Wellington region is big like all other regions in New Zealand so we can't simply engage with all of the members of the public so what we try to do is have a strategic approach um, to the way we do emergency management um, or engage with emergency management and have tools for individuals and people to actually help themselves so things like making water tanks available at lower cost, um, preparedness enablers is what we call them, um, grab and go bags that people can be pre prepared at home, at work, um, and plans and things so people can look at them, and that kind of thing. And where we primarily engage is in that community space, so a bit more larger scale because we can target more people in that area. And then civil defence basically just plays a supporting role to whatever is going on here. If we can get this stuff sorted, then we're going to be much better off and we can just support people in what they're doing day to day. But in order to engage with communities and to be able to create more resilience, we need to know what actually makes resilience. 
What are the attributes of a resilient community? Otherwise, we have no goals to work towards. So, what we did in our sort of shift towards community resilience was come up with some things that we thought, oh yeah, communities that are resilient will bounce back. These are kind of the characteristics or attributes that they have. So, connected communities, people that know each other, work together day to day, so that might be on different projects, are much better able to respond to an event if they've already known each other and they've worked together before. Empowered, so people actually care. If people don't care, people are not going to do something about it. So making sure that we can actually empower people and we're not just writing plans for them. That kind of thing. Communication, so people know where to go for information. They know who to ask for things. They know, they know each other so they can communicate really well in that event. Having realistic expectations is a big one. So people understanding, actually, I need to be part of the solution and, and act, actively contribute. Um, taking actions to reduce. So uh, we have it quite well in Wellington where people are quite aware of the impacts and everyone's sort of talking about the earthquakes and it's um, quite a big, uh, I guess, awareness in Wellington. But people are actually taking um, proactive approaches to what they can do to reduce the impact. So it might be securing their furniture or just little things like that. So trust and par partnerships. This is a really, um, I guess, wishy-washy one, but so, so important that we have uh, trust between our, ourselves, the community has trust between themselves, and they have trust between council and uh, civil events. And we saw that in Christchurch as a local example, having those partnerships and that active engagement between each other, um, the local level, the government level, and the um, community level is really important. Private sector, so that plays a large role in making sure that businesses themselves are proactive in doing business continuity plans so they can get up quickly um, running because that's what supports our community as well day to day. And the local governments, so it really begins with that local government level. They need to be empowered be able to respond to these kind of events and uh, even in the recovery they need to be an active role in that um, recovery. And people feel a sense of place and belonging. So a community that actually feels like it is, they are you know, part of the community, they belong there, they have a sense of um, worth I guess and um, they feel like they have something to contribute and they really like the place that they live in, it's going to be much better off to um, recover and respond from emergency. So the way in which we um, try to actively engage with our communities is through these three things. Building capacity, increasing connectedness and fostering cooperation. So building capacity is sort of, you know, people's ability to be able to respond and recover from events. So that's what I talked about before, your sort of basic preparedness enablers, um, building up people like the local governments, um, training and that kind of thing to do response and recovery. Connectedness, um, again, comes back to what um, Keith was saying about knowing your neighbours, it's about your connections, people knowing each other before the event. Um, and cooperation, working together, as I said. Um, things we work with are community response plans, similar to what uh, Keith does, but um, we have a different environment in Wellington. A lot of our communities are, can be isolated, so we find, again, the same problems as Auckland. You've got some communities that are really engaged already and some that are not so much. So it's yeah, trying to foster those people working together day to day and might be on a project that has nothing to do with emergency preparedness or management. Um, I was just talking to these guys before about a community that said, hey, we want a community garden, and after we ran one of these response plans and said, go for your lives, because you know, they thought, well, we'll get more sustainability, we'll be more green, we're working together, have emergency food afterwards. So it's about people working together, not necessarily on emergency preparedness. And uh, one of the um, attributes of a, a resilient community that really speaks to me is this last one, that people feel a sense of place and belonging in their community. In times of stress, people want to and can stay. And there's a really important difference between those two things. Because see, people might want to stay, but if we don't give them the mechanisms or the opportunities to be able to stay, then they'll leave. And one of the, um, I guess, greatest um, uh, 
challenges for any community that faces a disaster is that um, you know people are stressed, people um, that you know that buildings are damaged, all that kind of stuff, and people may leave. So that's one of the challenges that we really want to address and build up is people's ability to stay, especially in Wellington. So is the, the stress mechanism, fight or flight. Um, either people, you know, when you're faced with a hard event, you either fight or you flight. And we really want, ultimate goal for Wellington is to be able to fight. Because particularly because we have a transient um, population. Um, it's quite a small town, a city in terms of like comparing it to Auckland. Um, and yeah, the ultimate ideal thing we want is people actually feeling that sense of place and feeling that they can be able to. So how do we create that? And this is going into how we are um, looking at recovery as a beforehand something happens, um, which is challenging. I like this quote, a good city is like a good party. People stay much longer than really necessary because they're enjoying themselves. I think that's really important when we're looking at any city around the world, whether they're faced with disaster or not, you know, economic development, all that kind of stuff. It comes down to if you really like the place you stay in, and again, if you have the ability to stay there, you're going to stay there. So what are we doing to help people, you know, enable them to be able to stay if something happens and sort of foster that desire to want to stay? So what, people, so what can we do to keep the party start uh, after a disaster? Obviously there's things, hard infrastructure stuff that, you know, we can build up resilience within our um, networks. Let's say we have a goal of getting back our water system within a month rather than three, setting targets like that. Um, having flexible legislation so we can get people back quicker into places so they can rebuild their lives, they can get their businesses back up and running again. Making sure that we have housing for people. We're currently doing a project on looking at how we're going to house people in the CBD um, if they're in apartments and the CBD is cordoned off. Where can we use um, our open space network um, in the region because you know our region is very compact, particularly in the city centres, what can we do to utilise those? Schools. Making sure that schools get up and running because then people, kids can go to school and parents can get back to work. Um, and think, yeah, making sure businesses have their continuity plans so that they can get their livelihoods up and running again. And then again, local governments are actually um, doing the work, doing the recovery work, and they're supported by sectoral government. And people want to fight this. Um, we engage a lot with our community development teams and creating that sense of community. Um, and one of the biggest things, I guess, is making sure that we have culture of engagement. And not just a culture of engagement, but really effective engagement and making sure people have that voice day to day so that when it comes to recovery, we, um, they feel like they have a voice in what the future of their lives is. And one of the other points, People are supported in that psychosocial space. So often we see after an event, um, a lot of attention goes towards rebuilding the economy and buildings and hard infrastructure. And we often sort of think about social, the social side later. And so what we want is to start thinking about that before and what kind of things we could be doing to enable that to happen afterwards. So we're currently looking at creating a framework for um, recovery and just well, as well as engagement in that response side as well, and linking up all these actors that have um, a part to play in response and recovery and saying, hey, we've got some targets, how can we make that better? And getting these working, working groups um, together and brainstorming ways that we can, for instance, as we've heard before, you know, make our water come back one month rather than three months, enable schools to come back in three weeks rather than four weeks, whatever it is. Yeah. 